Now, here's Peter White with In Touch. Good evening. Tonight's potentially good news for a group of blind people who suffer from a form of sleep disruption, but bad news for visually impaired athletes with hopes of going to the Rio Paralympics in 2016, who've lost their funding. Now, it's reckoned that around 70% of people with no vision at all, that is, not even light perception, suffer from a particular form of disturbed sleep. It's known as non-24-hour sleep-wake disorder. It happens because your 24-hour sleep clock, which is regulated by the incidence of natural light, gets out of kilter. And that causes sleeplessness during the night and drowsiness during the day. Well, this can obviously have a very disruptive effect on many aspects of your life. Most people have this balance maintained by melatonin, which is a hormone generated by natural light. So what some people suffering from the condition have had to do is take melatonin artificially as a drug. As we've reported before on this programme, melatonin isn't licensed in the UK, so some GPs won't prescribe it. That leads to people facing the uncertainty of buying it online. Now, though, we're hearing about a new drug, Hetlios, which has been made specifically to treat this problem and has been approved in the States by the FDA, that's the Food and Drugs Administration. I've been talking to the chief executive of the company, which is producing it, but we also brought him together with Lucia Bellini, who's been dealing with this condition since childhood. My body clock shifts forward roughly about an hour and a half every three days. I may go to bed at, say, 10 o'clock and sleep and wake up at 6.30, and that will last for about three days, and then it will just get later and later and later, and it takes me about four weeks to complete the entire 24-hour cycle. And there is nothing that I can do about it. So I've tried, because I've had this problem for at least the last 15 years or so, and I've tried to force myself to stay awake during the day, and I still won't sleep at night, so I could last for about four days without having any sleep, or maybe two hours sleep in four days. So what effect does that, that have on you and your life? I mean, clearly it's disruptive, but can you explain what that does and how you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's ruined some very sort of significant times in my life, definitely. I mean, I definitely struggled through school and university. I thought it was my fault for years. I didn't know until I was about 21, so about eight, nine years ago, that it was linked with having a visual impairment. And presumably there's a build-up of this when you're going through the cycle that you described. And I think it's really difficult because I know they're going to build up and I know it's going to get worse and worse for me. I know in a few days time I'm, I might really struggle to stay awake and I spend nights kind of lying in bed trying to sleep and then I know that in a few hours time when it's time to get up that I'll be falling asleep during the day or really struggling to stay awake. So what treatment do you have? I have melatonin and I think it's really important to sort of emphasise that I get my own melatonin online, which is absolutely not recommendable at all. I started off talking to my GP. He was really understanding. One week he was on holiday. I went to get the repeat prescription and his son-in-law, who's another GP in the same practice, refused to prescribe it to me and he said that we can no longer prescribe it because we don't know enough about it you should work out other ways of dealing with this problem and I thought well it's either that or I'm going to end up having I'm not going to be able to work I'm going to really struggle so I got recommendations for a website I spoke to a friend of mine I also looked on the circadian sleep disorders web page I did a lot of research and I get my melatonin online and that helps. Well, how much does it help and how effective is it, would you say? It helps a bit. So if I haven't slept at all during the day, it will help me to sleep at night. I do have quite a lot of bad nights where I still don't sleep, but it definitely makes a difference. So if I manage to stay awake all day, it's very possible that I will then get a good night's sleep. And what you said it's not recommended to get it online, why not? because you don't nobody knows what they're getting. Um, let me bring in Dr Mihail Polymeropoulos, who is uh, chief executive of uh, Vanda Pharmaceuticals. Now, your company has developed a drug which you think will help with Lucia's problem. What does your drug offer, for example, which is different from melatonin? It is actually stories like Lucia's that inspired us over the years to uh, attempt to develop a therapeutic 
with a consistent efficacy and understood safety profile so that patients with non-24 hour sleep-wake disorder can take on a continuous basis. So does it do something different from melatonin? Melatonin, the actual molecule that endogenously circulates in our body, has been perfected through evolution to circulate in the blood as a hormone. It is not a molecule that you can eat as a pill and be predictably absorbed and have the kinetics in the bloodstream eventually result in the efficacy and safety profile. So would you say that this is going to offer a kind of stable solution for people like Lucia? We conducted uh, two control clinical studies. One of them lasted uh, for over six months and compared Hetlios taken once every night at the same time versus placebo. Mm -hmm. Those patients that received Hetlios showed significant and clinically meaningful improvements on their sleep-wake cycle. It is important to emphasize that non-24-hour disorder is not just another sleep disorder of amount. It is actually about timing. As Lucia very eloquently described, the advancing timing of sleep propensity by half an hour every day, resulting in something that us, uh, rest of the people that don't have non-24, should actually try to understand as if we are traveling one time zone every two days, eternally. <laughs> now, we understand this is likely to be more expensive than, say, melatonin, which could have implications, clearly, if it's going to be bought by the NHS. Would you expect that to be the case? I cannot make a comment on pricing, but the direction is that it will be priced like other orphan disorder rare drugs. There are drugs for multiple sclerosis, uh, narcolepsy, and other disorders that uh, affect a smaller number of individuals. So how long do you think it might be before this is available in the UK? It is a very complex process, <laughs> <laughs> applying. Uh, so hopefully uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we do have patients elsewhere in the continent, uh, in France and Germany. Some of them have taken the drug in a clinical trial setting for over three years and we want to make sure that uh, we have a European approval. Were there any side effects with the drugs in the trials that you did? We studied the safety in over 1,300 patients, some of them for over one or two years. The um, side effect profile was primarily mild in nature with some headaches that eventually went away. The other was a um, incidence of uh, vivid dreams most of the patients continued uh, nonetheless. OK. Lucia Bellini, you're here listening to this. It's your problem and you've got the chief executive of the company in front of you. Any any points you'd like to put to it? I think even without knowing if the drug is going to be successful to many people or not, the fact that somebody has actually wanted to research and try to make a difference because I just feel that because not many people know about this issue that it's been kind of left behind... I uh, personally, I'm a scientist, a physician that uh, worked on the Human Genome Project for many years, and therefore I'm keenly interested in understanding the molecular mechanism of disorders and developing therapeutics to precisely address the disorder and not just the underlying symptoms. So we are committed not only to spread the news about non-24 and what our drug may do, but also begin to forge a public relationship of the blind community with the sighted people and we have a responsibility if we can remove some of the hurdles to do so. That's Professor Mihel Polymeropoulos and you heard Lucia Bellini as well. We'd like to hear about your experiences of this condition and how you've dealt with it. Details about how to get in touch with us at the end of the programme. Now, some tough news for two of our Paralympic teams hoping to make it to the Paralympics in Rio. UK Sport has announced that both women's goalball and visually impaired five-a-side football have lost their funding. That amounts to getting on for £700,000 for goalball, nearly a million for the football team. Well, we all know what football is. Goalball is rather less well-known, but it's a game specifically designed for visually impaired players. Here are a couple of them giving us a thumbnail sketch. You have a volleyball-sized court and you have three players on each side of the court... All the players have shades on, so nobody can see anything at all. 
You have a basketball sized ball with a bell in it. And it's quite heavy, it's a kilo and a quarter. And you have to throw the ball along the floor as quickly as you can to the other side of the court. And then the players at the other side have to use their hearing to detect where the ball is. And then they have to dive to try and stop it. They then have to get up and throw the ball back. So, that's how you play. Well, I managed to catch up with UK Sports Chief Executive Liz Nicholl just before she hopped on a plane to the Winter Olympics at Sochi. And I asked her why these squads had had their money taken away. The assessment of the gap from where they are now to medal winning potential is too great to uh, achieve. And so our role at UK Sport is to align all our investment and resources behind you know, medal potential sports. So unfortunately a line has to be drawn and goalball and VI football are in this group where we can't be confident that they've got medal potential. Now both of these sports did receive additional funding over the past year only to have it taken away. I think they both really argue, has this really had time to bring about the improvements that they needed to make and which the, that funding was intended to do? Yes, and that's fair. I mean, Goldball has had uh, funding over a longer period than VI football has. There does seem an element in, in this method of saying, you know, to him that hath shall be given and to him that hath not shall be taken away, if I can use a kind of biblical <laughs> example. You know, isn't the problem here that if a sport is quite small and trying to develop, they're the ones that need the money? Yes, and I have to say that Goalball and the leadership of Goalball are doing a great job at actually trying to grow the sport, increase the number of participants, increase their income from other sources, so that they can provide better support for athletes from a very basic introductory level right through to developing their talent, so that they can actually have a system that sits beneath that which we fund that can ensure there's a throughput of athletes coming through into a sport uh, you know, for generations to come. What do they now have to do to get improve funding because I think you know it seems clear from what they're saying to us that they want to appeal against this decision and they want to talk to you. Yes they can appeal the seven sports that have been affected and they're four Olympic and three Paralympic can actually make representation directly to our board with a view to presenting any information they think we might have overlooked in assessing their medal potential. Every year we actually review all our investment to make sure it's all aligned behind our best medal prospects so we start the process in the autumn later this year. So we don't overlook. We don't want to overlook any potential medal prospects. And so, you know, but the support that the goalball organisation itself can provide for these young athletes and for the support that the football associations could and should probably get behind our VI football team, then actually they may well have made some progress that enables us to reassess that. Liz Nicholl. Well, Jeff Davis has been listening to Liz with me. He's the Football Association's National Development Manager, uh, which means he's got responsibility for encouraging football amongst disabled players. Uh, Jeff, I mean, Liz Nicholl says there this is where organisations like the FA uh, kind of need to, to, to step up, help visually impaired football reach standards where it can get its funding back. What do you say to that? Well, it was very interesting to uh, listen to Liz because the Football Association in itself actually wasn't granted the funding. It was granted to the Great Britain Disability Football Association Limited and the FA work on their behalf on performance services and provided administration. We support both the National VI League, the Partially Sighted League, and we support the National Blind League, as well as the talent programmes in each of the sports. But if they've lost nearly a million pounds, you're going to have to do more, aren't you? And the FA is a big organisation. Yes, we are. What Liz didn't mention is that a part of our bid for the investment was that the Football Association matched the £1 million that UK Sport actually put into uh, blind football. And in fact, what we will be doing post this decision, and we are going for an informal representation to the UK Sport Board, is that we'll be also looking at how can we maybe meet the funding shortfall if we can't convince UK Sport Board to reverse their decision. So what will it mean if this money is lost uh, in this uh, over this period of month, this next round? You know, will you, put bluntly, will you make up the shortfall? At the very worst, what will happen is that the full-time nature of the programme, because our players are full-time at the moment, they may have to go back to part-time. But previous to UK Sport putting any money into VI football, the Football Association have really supported blind football by, the, in 2010, we put over £200,000 into the uh, World Championships that was held in, in Hereford, leading up to the 2012 Paralympic Games, 
we pay for all of the support to the Great Britain team. Sure. But quite often money gets put in when the games are in in the UK and then, you know, maybe there isn't quite so much support to Rio. I mean, what effect do you think this will have on their chances of getting to Rio in 2016? What we will be doing is making sure that, as we have done for the last eight years, that we will enable these guys to go to major championships, to have training weekends, for us also to try and fast-track athletes that we talent ID, to really give them the chance and the team the best possible chance to qualify for uh, 2016. Jeff Davis, thank you very much indeed. So how do the athletes themselves feel? Well, Georgie Bullen plays at centre for the GB goalball team. She told me about the reaction to the news. Obviously, when it came through at first, we were incredibly shocked. I don't think any of us expected everything to go because it felt like, you know, it only came into place, the funding, quite recently. But... It's a challenge, and we like a challenge. We're athletes, that's what we do. But were you expecting some of the money to go? Yeah, I think we probably were, because we knew we'd had a bad result at the Europeans, and after all, they, at UK Sport, look at the results, see what there is on paper, and have to make their decision from that. And I know we've made improvements, but... It is difficult for UK Sport to just go off of that, give complete blind faith and leave us with all the money, but I think we weren't probably expecting all of it to go. You've just come from a training uh, camp over the weekend. What's the feeling amongst the other players? I think it's really actually going to bring us together because we will have to fundraise for tournaments like the European Bees coming up later this year. And as I say, we see it as a challenge and... Everyone wants to do goalball, whether there's money involved in goalball or not. Everyone was excited coming up with different fundraising ideas. I mean, what are some of the things that you perhaps won't be able to do? Are there things that you were getting paid for that you won't get the money for now? It was easier as far as getting strength and conditioning, paying for lots of physio. I mean, our our actual coach is paid up until May now, and after that she's just doing it off her own back Um, and there's going to be a lot of cases of that I think Um, but I mean we've been in the position of having very little funding in the past and we've really bounced back from that Uh, having funding isn't something we've actually become hugely used to so it's not as big a loss as if we were in a you know full-time training environment and having everything taken from under our feet we know we can do this and we've had got players on the team now who were involved in goalball right back before it had any funding whatsoever. So we know it's possible. Don't overdo it, Georgie. They'll think that you don't need the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but we, we've just got to prove to ourselves and to everyone around us that it's a challenge we're willing to accept. It makes the victory that much sweeter. Georgie Bullen. Well, we did invite the Goldball administrators onto the programme. They declined, but they did indicate that the reason was that they didn't want to prejudice any appeal they might be contemplating making. That's it for today. Your comments on anything you've heard, welcome as always. You can call our action line for 24 hours after the programme on 0800 044 You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk and there's more information on our website from where you can also download tonight's programme from tomorrow. From me, Peter White, producer Lee Kumatat and the team, goodbye.